Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana a Queer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Well, it, you... it, 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 it. <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's on your teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, good evening. It's me, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on State of the Nation tonight. The leaves are falling, which means the autumn statement is upon us. Tomorrow, the Chancellor of the Exchequer will unveil his new budget with tax cuts widely expected. But tonight, I will bring you State of the Nation's very own unexpurgated budget, so you can keep more of your hard-earned money. This is the bonfire of the taxes. And speaking of saving money, Foreign Aid is back in the news with a new approach from the once great Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. The UK is set to acknowledge its past, acting with humility, as it shifts away from outdated donor-recipient model to one of mutual respect, New Labour's linguistic infelicity remains as strong as ever. In an age of shifting geopolitical poles, you might expect that the United Nations would be busy with serious matters, but you would be wrong. The UN, in its unrivaled wisdom, has decided to castigate the United Kingdom's sentencing of Just Stop Oil protesters, and that's paid for by you. Plus, we're often told to respect people's preferred pronouns, but ought we to respect the alleged preferred pronouns of dead Roman emperors? Eligible Barless from the 3rd century is the case in point. It's um, a museum in Hertfordshire that has suggested we do so. State of the Nation starts now. I'll also be joined by a tremendously theatrical panel this evening, barrister and former Tory MP Jerry Hayes and the author and journalist Michael Crick. As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now, it's time for the news of the day with Tatiana Sanchez. Jacob, thank you very much and good evening. This is the latest from the GB newsroom. Police searching for a group of missing teenagers say they've recovered four bodies from a crashed car in North Wales. A major search was launched after Jevon Hurst, Harvey Owen, Wilf Henderson and Hugo Morris failed to return home from a camping trip in the Snowdonia area on Sunday. Police confirmed their car left the road near Tremadog. Superintendent Awine Llewellyn says it appears to have been a tragic accident. Shortly after 10am this morning, a member of the public contacted us reporting a vehicle having left the road between Bedgellet and Llanfrothen. Police officers attended and located a Ford Fiesta vehicle upside down partially submerged in water. Tragically, the bodies of four young males were recovered from within the vehicle. The national living wage will increase by almost 10%. More than 2 million full-time workers are set to benefit from a pay rise of more than £1,800 a year from next April. The announcement comes ahead of tomorrow's autumn statement. Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Laura Trott, earlier said it will help end low pay in the country. 
U.S. officials say a tentative deal between Israel and Hamas that could see a pause in fighting and the release of hostages has been agreed. It would see the release of 50 hostages, mostly women and children, in exchange for 150 Palestinian prisoners and a pause of four or five days. U.S. President Joe Biden says they're very close to getting those hostages freed. The government's most senior adviser during COVID says the plan in place before the pandemic was woefully deficient. The inquiry heard evidence from Sir Chris Whitty today. He said the plan had been drawn up by people who'd been through the swine flu, where the mortality rate was quite low. He also said policy decisions regarding quarantining were difficult. Lancashire Police has been criticised for its handling of the disappearance of Nicola Bully. A review found failings in the way personal information about Ms Bully's health struggles was disclosed to the press, which contributed to wild speculation. It said that non-reportable background information should have been provided to the media to help shape responsible reporting without disclosing sensitive information. And the president of South Korea says his country will work with the UK to bolster the political and economic security in the Indo-Pacific during an address to Parliament this evening. Earlier, the king and queen welcomed Yoon Suk-yeol and his wife at Horse Guards Parade. It's the first incoming state visit since the king's coronation and the second of his reign. The couple laid a wreath at the grave of the unknown warrior at Westminster Abbey today. And a state banquet is taking place this evening, set to host around 170 guests. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Now back to Jacob. It was William Gladstone, Liberal Prime Minister and Chancellor of the Exchequer in the 19th century, who said in one of his briefer speeches, a mere four and three quarter hours, that by the 5th of April 1860, the income tax will by law expire and that money ought to fructify in the pockets of the people. Well, in those days, income tax was about 3%. And here we are, more than 160 years later, with income tax alive and kicking, taking as much as 45p in the pound from the British people, with some marginal rates over 100% in certain circumstances. I discovered that if you are a person with six children earning £50,000 a year, you face a marginal tax rate of 96%. And if you have a seventh child, it goes over 100%. So be careful about those seventh children. But there's hope. For the autumn statement will be unveiled tomorrow and tax cuts are widely expected. And we'll talk about what has happened tomorrow, but this is what I think should be done. We need to be thinking about growth. We need an economy that will grow, and that needs taxes at the right level that don't inhibit growth. So, bear in mind that the OBR has consistently underestimated the public finances. It's got them wrong again and again. This year, it's thought there'll be £20 billion of headroom from the OBR's previous predictions. So we should give that money back to people. But we should also cut spending. I'm not in favour of unfunded tax cuts. I don't think that works. I don't think it's the right way to proceed. But every pound of your money we spend should be spent well. So when we cancelled, when the Prime Minister announced the cancellation of the northern part of HS2, he shouldn't have reallocated that money. It should be saved. Just reallocating it doesn't mean that the process of spending it has been well thought through. It was something really for a party conference speech. That money should be saved. The civil service should be reduced. Uh, when I was the Minister for Government Efficiency, we had a plan to get it back to 2015 16 levels, which could have saved five to six billion pounds. The proposed welfare changes encouraging people to go into work from 2025 should be brought forward to 2024. If you do things like this, you'd suddenly find you've got about £30 billion that you could return to taxpayers. Bear in mind, it's your money. There is no such thing as government money. And where should this go? Well, it should prioritise investment, helping businesses and removing the penal effects of inflation. Inheritance tax. You may think that inheritance tax is just a boon for the rich, but it's not. It falls on many people whose only asset is their family home, but it also has damaging, distortive effects on how capital is allocated, because people invest their money 
for tax reasons, not for the best economic reason. And why is it better to invest in a small company on AIM than to invest in one of Britain's leading corporations? One of them faces a 40p in the pound death duty, the others zero rated. This doesn't make sense. We want people to make the best investments. Only raves, raises £7 billion a year, it should go altogether. It would have a strong economic benefit in terms of the allocation of capital. The VAT threshold should be raised from its current £80,000. Lots of businesses get to March and don't want to do any more business, small businesses, sole traders, because if they do, they suddenly have to put their prices up by 20%. That limit should be raised or it should be staggered so that people don't go from zero to 20% in one fell swoop. Corporation tax. Corporation tax increased the amount of revenue it took from 2011-12, 34 billion, to 2021-22 of 63 billion. It almost doubled as it was slashed. This was really tremendously important, um, had a beneficial effect on receipts and for companies. Much better to have low rates and few write-offs. George Osborne was right on corporation tax. We should try and get back to that 19p rate and thresholds that have been eaten into by inflation. We should do as much as we can with the money available to try and restore those thresholds. That really should be a priority because that is a genuine cut in income in real terms for people up and down the country. So that's trying to get the best out of the money available to make sure that people have the money they need in their pockets. This bonfire of taxes will potentially ignite the British economy and, as Gladstone put it, allow money to fructify in the pockets of the British people. As always, I want to hear from you, mailmog at gbnews.com. Uh, but I'm delighted now to be joined by Joe Michel, Professor of Economics at the University of the West of England in Bristol. Joe, thank you very much for joining me. Isn't it time we gave some money back to hard-pressed taxpayers? I think you're looking in the wrong direction. I like this uh, phrase, fructifying in the, in the pockets, because I do think that the proposals you're making, cutting inheritance tax, um, cutting corporation tax, and so on, would really not lead to, as you say, uh, growth. You haven't given us really a, a good reason why all of these things somehow lead to growth. And as we know, growth has been extremely weak over the last 15 years, really since the austerity experiment uh, of George Osborne and so on. We've seen pretty much flatlining productivity and very weak growth. And I think these kinds of tax giveaways um, you know, inheritance tax, 83% of people don't pay any inheritance tax. The great majority goes to the very, very top earners, people with uh, estates over 1 million. That money will exactly fructify. What does fructify mean? It means kind of, I don't know, it's one of those nice sounding words. It sounds to me like turning into some kind of sticky substance and never coming back out of the pocket again. No, uh, fructify means grow. And the, the reason for focusing on inheritance tax, why it's important, is that it's a particularly economically distortive tax that Taxes that on cash actions, such as um, capital gains tax and particularly income tax, are less distortive because the cash is there at that time. With death duties and with the um, allowances around death duties, you encourage people to take bad investments or to hold on to investments beyond their natural uh, point of redemption because of the tax advantages. And that leads to money being badly allocated, which is inevitably um, a dampener on growth. Well, I agree that there are um, aspects of the way inheritance tax is organized. There are exemptions for certain things, as you say, for you know investments in uh, alternative uh, investment vehicles, um, some exemptions for agriculture and business and so on. And I think there is a good case actually for um, getting rid of a lot of that um, stuff. But the idea that um, the direction of money into different financial instruments driven by distortions from inheritance tax, which as we say affects a very small number of people in estates, is somehow behind the weak growth um, story that we've seen over the last 15 years, I find very implausible. It's not to do with how retail investors allocate their portfolios between small stocks and large stocks, which is the, the source of the weakness of our economy. It's the lack of strategic thinking, the lack of long run planning and the lack of investment coming from the government. I don't think we should be blaming. Small I'm not sure that's right, that. because 
actually private sector investment is usually much more profitable and effective than state investment. Just look at the mess made of HS2 and the enormously wasteful expenditure of money. And leaving money with individuals and businesses to invest is a much better way of doing it than thinking the state can direct investment, which we tried in the 60s and 70s, and it failed miserably. It led to things like Concord. I mean, Concord was a great success in many ways, and I think what nearly But it lost the millions. Exposed, it cost millions, and it was a great success. It was a flagship for the country. It was the fastest airplane on the planet. It was a great, which never um, had a commercial it, success. It, it, it was a leading edge for the aerospace industry here in Bristol, where I am, and still we have great amounts of industry: car engines, um, aerospace engines, technology associated with that, which is part of that process uh, uh, of the interaction between they, public well, Jay, and private I'm, investment. I'm sorry to cut you off because we're out of time, but thank you so much. I think you've made my point on thinking that Concord was a success. It was beautiful, but it was a beautiful economic failure. Uh, but with me now is the former Tony Blair advisor, Darren Murphy. Um, Darren, thank you very much for joining me. Um, it was Peter Mandelson who said he had no objection to people being being rich. And New Labour wasn't against people keeping their own money. Indeed, the 45p rate was very late brown rather than any part of Blair. So is there a Blairite case for cutting taxes? I think what is important is, first of all, to say that people like me are very glad that the Labour Party under Keir Starmer has changed and gone back to being a party where economic responsibility is front and centre of the way that uh, it functions and the way it thinks about economic policy. But what I would say, and I think this is really quite important given your conversation about tax cuts, is since I think for the whole time that you were in government, from since 2019 anyway, um, there have been something like 25 uh, tax rises. Uh, and that's costing each and every household in the country at least four thousand pounds a year so i think there is a point where people realize that we're not getting value for money and the way that this country is being run the way this decisions are made within government as we're seeing with the covid inquiry is so bad the number of chancellors we've had the number of prime ministers we've had is that taxpayers aren't getting value for money from a government that's really not capable but if you look at public sector productivity Public sector productivity hasn't risen since 1997, and we all know what happened in 1997. I think most people, when they think about productivity, would just remember not 1997, but 12 months ago when uh, Liz Truss managed to essentially wreck... No, that, that's not the, productivity. Uh, that's a, compl that, the, that's a very interesting economy, discussion. But that's not productivity. Decisions. Why has productivity yeah. not risen for such a long period? What is wrong with the public sector? Why can it not increase productivity when the private sector in that period has increased well, productivity significantly? Okay, well, let me give you an example from when I was in the Department of Health. We had lots of pressure as per the, the previous discussion actually on this channel, about having more doctors and more nurses. If you measure the productivity of the National Health Service, if even when it's treating more patients, if it has a considerable increase in the number of doctors and nurses and therapists and other uh, health-facing staff, uh, patient-facing staff, the productivity will fall. And so sometimes, it isn't quite as easy to say, uh, talk about public sector productivity, because in many ways, if you're talking about healthcare, the amount of nurses per patient, the amount of doctors per patient, actually improves the care that they're providing. So I think well, it is more complicated, J J Jacob, well, up to, than up, simply saying it's about private sector public up to, sector. Up to a point. No one can get to see their GP, even if there are more of them. But thank you very much, Darren. Coming up, okay. as the noble Lord Lord Cameron returns to the fold with a declaration of intent to end world poverty, is it time to turn foreign aid into real investment? And don't forget, ought we to recognise the preferred pronouns of a third century Roman emperor? Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. 
I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aqueer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, is, 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 is. <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's on your teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. I'm still Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, and this is still Save the Nation. The Foreign Office, that colossus that once ruled a quarter of the world, will now allow countries to decide for themselves how to spend our £11 billion that we give them, after Lord Cameron claimed he was on a moral mission to end world poverty. The new Foreign Secretary released the government's white paper on international development, which focuses heavily on international aid and supporting countries tackling climate change. This shows all the signs of continuation of new Labour's awful legacy of using terms like equitable, mutual respect, humility of acknowledging our past. None of it seems to have anything to do with our own strategic interests, and rather towards, quote, shaping the solutions they want to see rather than accepting the ones we think they need. What has reduced global poverty has in fact been increased trade, particularly with China and India. This chart is really important. It shows that global poverty has declined the most in China and India because of trade, not aid, people coming in to the global financial system. Anyway, with me now to discuss this is my panel, the barrister and former Tory MP, Jerry Hayes, and the author and journalist, uh, Michael Crick. Um, Michael, trade and open markets is what has seen global poverty, absolute poverty, go down from nearly 2 billion people to about 700 million people. That's what's changed it. It's not the aid budget. Well, you may be right on that, and I'm, you know, I'm all in favour of trade. I'm sure Jerry is as well. Yes. But uh, I do think that it is scandalous the way in which this Prime Minister, when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, led the moves to reduce the aid budget. Um, and I think it's it's wonderful news that David Cameron is determined to, that this country should take aid seriously again, as he did when he was Prime Minister, and as as was the case under Blair and Brown. We led the world in our commitment to aid, and aid can 
do a huge amount, not just for economies, oh. saving people's <laughs> lives. Gosh, oh. what, now, we, now we've got some quotes. Oh, yes. Some, well, we've, some... got, we've, got all sort, we've got all sorts of quotes yes, from, this, yes. from this book. Yes. Well, um, there may be but, ridiculous language in there. I'm sure there is. But, yeah, that, but that's, do you think we yeah. should be apologising for our past? I think, Jerry. No, well, of course we shouldn't be apologising for our past. There are but, aspects of our well, past we should apologise yeah. for. This yeah. is not David Cameron. This is something the Foreign Office produced yes. before he was a, a twinkle uh, in the Prime Minister's eye. Um, but um, uh, Andrew Mitchell uh, has been overseeing this for some time. The government really shouldn't put out documents that are talking about humility and acknowledging our past. That surely we should be proud of what we've done. Well, I, I mean, to, to, to Michael's point, uh, that if you are a believer in aid, actually what we've done over the last 10 years has been important. Of course it's And soft. over the last several hundred years, yeah. we have been a country that has spread civilization, the rule of law, democracy, all sorts of benefits to the globe. Yes. And we should be boasting about that, not apologising. Well, I, I think you have to have a certain tone nowadays. It's rather depressing, isn't it? Who's that journalist, Trevelyan, who's just given, uh, what, £100,000 of the family fortune because they made a lot of money out of slavery 200 years ago? That's insane. insane. And then... It's not insane. It is a very good uh, <laughs> act. And I... I, no, I it's, it's insane. It's not. It's going You're to benefit the... whoever gets the gets well, that's the great gift for them. Yes. Well, yes. Yeah, I'm probably uh, a uh, Viking. Uh, I'm probably a Viking. I used to have blonde hair. Well, I, well, I, 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 I think. I think. You then, you know, there are aspects exactly. of our, exactly. there are aspects right. of our past, uh, like the slave trade, that we shouldn't be proud of. But then we should be proud of the fact that we were the, among the first to get rid ago. of slavery. But so then, there, there, yes. the other thing I want to ask you about yes. is we say China's using its money to increase its influence, and that's. A bad so. thing. Surely we should use our money to increase our influence. But it's, we always have done. Well, that, 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 is what, that. that is what is that it's is soft power. Yes, we've always used that. And, now, and we're wittering on about letting countries spend as they like. Surely the whole thing is about our influence and power. It's taxpayers' yes, money. One has to be gentle in what one okay. says. We have to convert you, people. So whilst we're being gentle. Why do we want to kill babies at the oh, taxpayers' this is page expense? 61, is 89, it? actually. Is it right. 89? Page 89, that we want to spend British taxpayers' money on abortion when it is a free vote issue in the House of Commons. I think that's a scandal that we want to kill babies in poor countries. It's a really dreadful thing to do. Well, there are, most people in this country don't share your views on abortion, and a lot of the. Uh, the, the another aspect of the policy is contraception, and uh, in, in many places, the fact that people have too many children is, is one of the factors leading to poverty. No, it's not. If it's we can the help, other way around. If we can help them well. make the choice... No, 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 as you know perfectly I mean, We're not well. forcing people to have abortions. No, we're the, not forcing people to take the, the, the correlation is the other way around, that as people get more prosperous, they have fewer children, not they have fewer children and become more prosperous. That's been true of countries across the world. So what would you do? Even you would, before you, 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 uh, contraception uh, came in. Right, so you would pay people to have more children, would you? Well, in this country, we've got a population crisis. I think well, not really. And in Italy no, and in South Korea, we've got... Most, the, the, population, the, the population is going up in this country. But I think using taxpayers' money to kill foreign babies is really dreadful. I, but we must I, move on oh. <laughs> to other news, to oh. Argentina, where there's been a decisive presidential election winner. Javier Millet, the self-described anarcho-capitalist. He's not the bureaucratic establishment-style president you might expect. Millet has pledged to dollarize the Argentine struggling economy, with inflation in triple digits, 140% last I heard. He's been named to campaign waving a chainsaw around. So he's even more charismatic than Boris, who's never done that. He's announced he speaks to his deceased dog via a medium, of course. which is a bit potty. And he used to be a lead singer in a Rolling Stones cover band, whatever that may be. Here are some clips. Ministerio de Turismo y Deporte, afuera. Ministerio de Cultura, afuera. Ministerio de Ambiente y Desarrollo Sostenible, afuera. Ministerio de las Mujeres y Género y Diversidad, afuera. Well, I never realised the Rolling Stones looked like that, but um, <laughs> it reminds me of when I tried to get find some film or even audio of Tony Blair in his rock oh, band. Yes, did you the ugly rumours. I I failed. I even make an, made an appeal on Newsnight. It's all been um, destroyed or covered up. But uh, well, the anyway, sorry. Of him naked. They never found that. Right. Well, let's not go into that. <laughs> we'll leave that to one side. 
But he is proposing getting rid of ministries that don't do any good, saving money, getting rid of corruption, and dealing with inflation in Argentina Pause. once and for all by just Pause. adopting Pause. the US dollar. Pause. He wants to retake the Falklands. Well, all Argentinians want to retake the Falklands, but he's not going to war over it, well, is he? We don't know. When things get tough, people yeah. go to war. But it's been the formal position of every Argentine president. Of course and he, it he questions uh, man made climate change, which no doubt you do as well. Um, he questions the number of people killed during the dictatorship. Uh, he's an admirer of Bolsonaro and Trump. And he's very. Rude. He talks openly about uh, threesomes, presumably once one with Bolsonaro and Trump. He seems like. Uh, and he's army, very, frankly. He's and this idea of you just closing down do all not, these government departments, not, it won't happen. Like, Politicians always promise that. You promised it a few times. He hasn't promised a threesome. I don't think he knows what one is. But, uh, I think no, I'm not sure I do. <laughs> Democrats but, it's, is it the Holy Trinity? Um, but, <laughs> oh, <dear>. but he's, <laughs> You're in trouble he's now. Also, he's also very rude about the Holy Father. I watched an interview with him. Yes. He thinks the Pope's a communist. Yes. Well, well, I don't think people should say things like that. Well, but who cares? The fact but, of the matter is, we, we must not underestimate Maitin. We must just not treat him as a joke. Ho, ho, mm. ho, ho. We've got to be very, very wary of him indeed. I, but does not show news. something serious that people are fed up with day to day politics because day to day politics hasn't been living for them? Hence, other politicians who have come forward in similar circumstances. Well, we had that in, where was it? Peter Mandelson's old seat, where you've got Hangus. Hangus the monkey, do you remember? Well, I, I do indeed. There's okay. something to do with on the Napoleonic Wars, but unfortunately, much I'd like to discuss the Napoleonic Wars, I think I'm doing that on Thursday, uh, we're going to have to move on, so thank you to my panel. Coming up, a friend of State of the Nation has been sentenced to prison for six months. Find out who it is in just a moment. It's not Jerry. Uh, plus, do Roman insults indicate gender identity? exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aqueer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, well, it, you... <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's on your teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> 
my CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Welcome back. It's been a busy few days for our friends at Just Stop Oil. Over the weekend, hundreds marched in central London, with one being arrested, carried by the police into the back of a van. But the courts have been cracking down on this behaviour. You may remember an old friend of the programme, Phoebe Plummer, the one who poured soup onto Van Gogh's sunflowers. She appeared on State of the Nation earlier this year. Quite frankly, I'm not a scientist. What I'm doing is I'm looking at the world, and we're living the, the effects of the climate crisis today. Right now, people are dying. Children are starving. But Families are fleeing their homes. But energy... Is and it's preventable. Energy we have the solution. Well, she was sentenced last week to six months in prison for engaging in a slow march. The United Nations, at a time when you'd thought they'd have been busy with things going on around the world and the turmoil that there is, has taken the bizarre decision to get involved in this domestic dispute, claiming the UK's sentences of such protesters could be in breach of international law. Well, I'm now joined by Just Stop Oil spokesman Cameron Ford. Cameron, thank you for coming in. I mean, although I don't think this is any of the UN's business, and it's not a matter of international law, our criminal justice system. Phoebe's gone to prison for six months. That seems a long time. Yeah, it is. I mean, this country, as the UN is pointing out, is not allowing the cornerstone of democracy, which is our right to protest. Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. The UN is calling it out. It's not, you know, if the UN was calling it out in, in another country and we didn't think that their human rights um, profile was up to scratch, we'd applaud the UN. And that's what they're doing here. And I, and we have to take a hard look at ourselves and say, you know, where is our state of democracy at? Well, there's always got to be a balance, hasn't there? That the right to protest is an important part of democracy, freedom of speech an even more important one. Um, but Just Stop Oil has done things like stopping ambulances, getting people to hospital. That's not true. That's a lie. Well, you know that's, that's true. That, that, this has been widely Do recorded. Do a freedom there of information request to the ambulance service like we have. The, that's a lie, Jacob. But we, we've seen it. We've seen it on television with ambulances stuck behind these if protesters. The freedom of information has, it, has shown that there's been no you, significant delays to ambulances. We oh, have a significant. So no significant, no significant delays. So there have been delays protest to ambulances. Protest is an, is an interruption. Okay. You can't get around that. Effective protest is. If you want to stand on the pavement and wave some little flags around hoping for the for our future that's not an appropriate response to what you folks in government are doing to but, us right but what now I, what i've said to your other spokesman is why don't you stand for election because it doesn't work jacob how much money is behind you how much money did the tories the, the, get the, from the fossil fuel industry the amount you know, of money the, that you can the, spend in a, in a general it, election is first, strictly first limited by law system that yes. means for a green mp to get in you've got to get two million votes the, and for a tory one twenty thousand no, the system's that's broken not, that's not jacob, true at all everyone that's is not disenfranchised with parliament but that's right not true now. at all Absolutely to win to win in this country you have to win in an individual constituency and, and the labor party do you need to run each individual constituency a few thousand Pounds. The, a few the, thousand pounds. The, you think the, I could compete the, with you the, in some sense for a few, few thousand pounds? If you've got the support that you claim, then people will give you money. You're pretty well funded. You've had funders to help you pay for these protests and for your lawyers. The support is not about whether people support us or not. The issue is that 60 to 70 percent of people don't feel the government is doing enough to tackle well, the climate crisis. Well, stand for election crisis. and then you'd win. If this that's is what people bollocks. think... That's bollocks if you think that well, we don't, say, we don't have democracy. We oh, don't. I, I'm you, sorry, we you're not allowed to, don't. I'm sorry to be boring, but you're not allowed to use that sort of language, say, to my viewers well, who are is. sensitive souls and to uh, Ofcom. Well, I appreciate I'm sorry for the language. After the sensitive souls by trying to get your government to start acting on the climate crisis, which well, is what we, we've most reduced, people We've want. reduced our emissions in this country by 40% since 1990. Why are we opening new oil and gas licences? Because we need oil and gas, and nobody's saying we're You're not going to use it. You're living in the Victorian era. We've well, got no, new not, technology. Actually. That was coal. Uh, no, we're living so far. You're like a dinosaur back in the old ages. We've got new dinosaurs tech. Dinosaurs didn't have any of we've this. We've got new technology, OK? You're trying to keep us with a technology that is over 100 years old. It's bonkers. OK, get with the times. We can move forward, have cleaner, cheaper energy. OK, we don't... We, well, that's fantasy, that we don't have that at the moment. Because we, we subsidise be, fossil fuels We don't subsidise fossil fuels. That, that's a lie. No, you it's just not. Lied. No, no, we I don't subsidise fossil you, fuels. Will you tell me one subsidy we give to fossil fuels? £235 million in subsidies... What do you mean by subsidy? 
by the money that they get as tax breaks that they oh, would otherwise be no, paying. No, this isn't a subsidy. A subsidy is when you the pay pay somebody cash. When somebody doesn't pay tax because they are investing, that's not a subsidy. That's not a cash payment to them. But there's no that's incentive just a different for them tax to rate. invest in green technology. They, Nowhere near the same they, way that they are the encouraged to still dig up dead the oil dinosaurs in the pay, North Sea. They pay a higher rate of tax than any other and company in this country. how much money are they making? They're raking it in whilst the rest and, of us can't put bread on the they table. Make, they make a huge Don't make contribution. out like they're the charity. They make a huge contribution to the Exchequer. Where would you replace that from? We can get our energy from renewable sources. We could okay. insulate and build houses much better than we are currently. Where's the money you know? coming from to do this? Where, where is the money coming from to prop up all these institutions right now? They have so much money. We're the sixth wealthiest nation. Yes, okay? and we're the sixth wealthiest nation because we've got energy that people can afford. And the US people has People can't afford faster, their bills. The US I don't has know where you're getting your energy from, since but 2010 than we it. have because it's had cheaper energy. The cost of electricity in the US is half what it is in the UK. And that's helping their economic growth. And that helps get people out of poverty. Okay, but the scientists are saying new oil and gas, OK, is not the way forward. So whether well, whether you're some scientists it, are, some, but we've got ninety nine percent. We've scientists. got to get we've got to get whether oil and gas from somewhere. It's less emitting if we get our domestic that's sources, as sold, you that's know. That's a lie. That's a lie. It's, it's, it's sold not, on the open market. That's a lie. It reduces emissions overall if we get it out than if it's got out by other countries. And but we're then going if we go our, sell it all the way over there and ship it over there, to, what about that? We're going to have to draw to a close now. But thank you, Cameron. Uh, before I hand back over to the panel, some interesting news emerged last week: a case of climate These fanatics getting a taste of. Of their own disruptive medicine. We are destabilizing the biosphere and the very systems we depend on to survive as a civilization. We are not standing on the brink of a catastrophe, we are living in it. People on the front lines of the climate crisis have been experiencing the first hand consequences of it for decades now, and they have been sounding the alarm, but we have not been listening. The people in power have not been listening. I come here for a climate demonstration, not a political group. With me now is my panel, barrister and former Tory MP Jerry Hayes, North and journalist Michael Crick. Jerry, you're a lawyer. Mm. Um, six month sentence seems quite harsh. Not quite sure what she was sentenced for, actually. Uh, I think it may have been over the, the Elizabeth Bridge. It may have been criminal damage, I don't know. But they'll only serve half of that, so it's three months. Even so, I mean, yeah. Michael. People do seem to get much shorter sentences for worse. Uh, I mean, it's very difficult to compare, and I'm not a lawyer. And no, no, uh, six months. I mean, especially at the time when you know the government is saying actually they're not going to have any. It's uh, the maximum magistrates court can give. Yes. Um, I'd like to have more details on that, and sadly we, we, we just don't know. But I agree, it seems a little bit... It, I mean, I'm, I'm all in favour of yeah, a so reasonable I. response. And I thought the people who climbed on the Dartford crossing deserved yeah. strong sentences because of enormous disruption, but also the sheer danger of, of what they were doing. Yeah. But, but if, as Cameron was saying, this was for marching, that, do, that does seem harsh. He but... should have appealed to the Crown Court for that sentence, I'd have thought. Right, well, we'll have to... I mean, what else do you get six months for these days? Oh, no. Not a lot. Really? Well, I mean, burglary or yes. assault. You certainly don't get it for shoplifting, do you? Because they don't prosecute shoplifters, oh, which we've discussed prosecute. a number they of do, times. They, they do prosecute shoplifters. Well, one in a hundred or something. Well, you know, in my day, what they, what, when I say when I first started, there used to be private prosecutions, which seems to be the most sensible thing, which would save the taxpayer an awful lot of money. Why should the state be paying for shoplifters to be prosecuted? It seems staffed. But then... but because the state runs law and order, that's the whole point. It's the job of the state to protect us. That's why we pay taxes for the police and for the prosecutors, surely. Oh, no, but it should be for the big stores to, to deal with it. They always have done it. So if you're, if you're burgled, should you bring a private prosecution? No, because you're quite well to not. do. Of course not. And you know the law, you're a barrister. Yes, I do. But no, no. No, sure. I mean, Michael, surely the, no, the job you, of the Jacob, state... No, I agree with you, it is the job of the state to do... The trouble is, the state is overwhelmed, the, the criminal justice system oh, is overwhelmed. Oh, it's fallen apart. And it's fallen it's apart, fallen and, apart. It, and it's, you know, and a lot of it flows from the huge It's not cuts COVID. That's it's not COVID. You know, 2,200 it, it, criminal barristers are left 
in this country, because yeah. a lot of them have fled. Yeah. There is a backlog, and it's little to do with COVID. It's due to underfunding when successive Conservative governments and said to judges, don't sit, so we save money. Absolutely and, and, and the Department of Justice in the early teens, under people like Ken Clark and Chris Grayling, was, was, was regarded and as I'm a... And I'm afraid a, Jack was Straw a as well. Yeah. Well, it's it the started the under Jack. Well, it's the change of the Constitution. But once you take the Lord Chancellor away from being a judge and the protection of the judges, you have downgraded the political power no, that, that, that's of, of the judiciary. No, that's just wrong. You, you haven't done that. You've still got the constitutional duty to protect the judges. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, but, but, oh, no, no. But the role of Lord no, Chancellor was no, so important. No, 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 yes, I agree. And, of course, it was trashed by Liz Truss. Liz Truss was the most disgraceful Lord Chancellor when she said no, she would not defend yeah, 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 the judiciary no, 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 but this is against nonsense. enemies this of is the non people. This is nonsense because true. this all goes back to the ridiculous creation of the Supreme Court, taking the Lord Chancellor out of being the no. Speaker of the um, no. House of Lords, a senior judge, and in the Cabinet. That that was a wonderful no. constitutional construction. The Lord Justice, you, the Lord. Li no. Liz Truss would never have been Lord Chancellor if we hadn't, if Labour hadn't vandalised the. There were also she, massive, massive. She, Massive cuts in, in yeah. the whole of the Justice Department, legal yeah. aid, prisons, the, the criminal justice system, and no wonder yeah. the whole thing is grinding to a halt she, so it's and all undermining. Sorry? No, it's, it's all George Osborne's fault. George <laughs> well, I, yeah, I he it. helped. Uh, Osborne, he Osborne, he helped. And, he, and Osborne and other Conservatives who, who succumbed. Right, trash, thank you, trash thank you. the system. <laughs> thank you. She betrayed her oath. Thank you to my panel. I need a mute button for them, I think. Yes. Coming up, the moment you've all been waiting for, the moment the British public answer the question, should we respect the preferred pronouns of third century Roman emperors deceased? On Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., Argentina's new PM vows to take the Falklands back. Do we need to do everything to tell him hands off? There are. Plus, Phil the Power Taylor backs Nigel in more ways than one. Nigel Farage is good at politics. I like him. I'd vote for him if he was Prime Minister, trust me. Find out what he had to say about Farage down under us. Tune in to the most exciting paper of you anywhere on the telly. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11. Be there. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
tired of the usual focus tested pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. Well, now the moment perhaps you've all been waiting for, the question of transgenderism in ancient Rome. The North Hertfordshire Museum has announced it will now classify the Roman Emperor Elagabulus as trans, owing to classical texts that claim the Emperor preferred to be referred to as a lady. Perhaps it's no surprise that the council-run museum is advised by Stonewall on such matters. But Vox Populi Vox Day, good Latin term, today we asked the great people of Birmingham if they thought we ought to respect the preferred pronouns of third century Roman emperors, and the people have spoken. I feel, I feel as though things should be kept the way they were. It's obviously 2023 now. I don't think we should tr be trying to apply 2023 standards to ancient times. It's a different era, a different time, people believe different things. And I think certain things should be left alone. Uh, there are two genders, you're either male or female. I think they get sexuality mixed up with gender. Virtual signalling. They're virtual signalling. They want to be, um, they want to be with the trend and the trend is woke stuff. The sooner we get rid of the woke stuff, the better this country will be. It was a long time ago. What does it really matter? Honestly, it doesn't matter. I'm sure it cost somebody a lot of money to change all the paperwork. So really, as I say, it doesn't matter. It was, or she was, or it was, or whoever was, what it was. Money. Well, I love the good sense of that lady. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. But I'm now joined by GB News headliners, comedian and writer Simon Evans. Um, Simon, uh, Elagabulus, do you think he should be respected as a she? Or well, is this nonsense? Now, you've begged the question there immediately, Jacob, and have selected the, uh, the outdated pronoun for Elagab. Uh, I suppose the, the view would change depending on whether you're looking for historical authenticity or the ability to capture headlines, which this Hitchin Museum has clearly cleverly managed to do. Well, we're discussing it now. We are, and we've ignored them all these years until now. In fact, I grew up in St Albans, uh, which is famous for Verulamium, uh, which is the rival Roman museum, and I'm rather disappointed that my first mention of a Hertfordshire Roman remain should be with regard to Hitchin. So um, they've obviously played their hand well. St Albans himself, the proto-martyr. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Um, very important figure uh, in the history of this nation. Mm. Um, but you've looked up Gibbon, famous for his yes. wonderful, glorious work on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Absolutely. I, w this story came to our attention on Headliners last night, and I had, a, um, I had the opportunity to investigate. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of Gibbon, if you like, because uh, he, he gives it to you straight. Elagabulus, corrupted by his youth, his country and his fortune, abandoned himself to the grossest pleasures with ungoverned fury and soon found disgust and satiety in the midst of his enjoyments. He went on for some length on that sort of thing. Right. So, think... so he's debauched. He's yes. our vision of a Roman emperor well, who... To some extent, he was only 14 when he was elevated, okay. and he was assassinated four years later at 18. And he brought infamy upon the uh, the office. But lots of them did. Yes, they did, absolutely. It wasn't a great time for the empire at all. Um, he was succeeded by uh, a cousin, I think, who plunged the empire itself into... Uh, civil strife and economic ruin. So, to an extent, Elagabulus just cavorting around the um, the palace was probably a, a minor consideration. But he um, is thought to have prostituted himself out to various uh, male courtiers and okay, so on. Which Nero did as well, didn't he? He's thought to have done Lisa, similar things. Yes. Uh, he also had four wives, one of which was a Vestal Virgin. He did not attempt to Which was to against raise, the rules. Absolutely. Very much the name, job title, you know, supposed yeah. to say what it does on the tin. Um, and, uh, and Elagabulus, his own name, he was actually, um, I was going to say christened, that wouldn't be right, but he, his original birth name was Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. So he, had, quite he, so he some... had a good, strong name. Marcus Aurelius, so. one of the better, Roman, yeah, one of the great Roman emperors. And he was of that line. But um, he, was, he also had Syrian blood in him, and Elagabulus was a Syrian sun god whom he attempted to elevate above Jupiter in the Pantheon. So he was quite... He was trouble. You know? he, he was trouble, but... Yeah. 
Did anyone in ancient Rome think about trans issues, or was this actually what you said about your enemies, that you said, oh, he behaves like a woman, and that was the criticism of the propagandists that came came after? Very hard to say, isn't it? Even now we're arguing whether or not Richard III had a hunchback, and we have four or five hundred years later. It's very hard to tell, but it, there's certainly an element of that. But there is some... Uh, textual evidence to suggest that he did at one stage um, desire the surgical intervention to provide him with a vagina. Uh, that would be a fairly sort but of straight ahead trans issue. Surgeons without any anaesthetic couldn't really do that, could they? No, I, mean, I, think, a I think it was a pretty plus. grisly idea. Yes, I think so. I think he possibly, although, and also oddly, he, the surviving bust, the one that's mainly figured on the internet anyway, seems to show him having a moustache, which is unusual even by Roman standards, let alone among trans community. And he had four wives. Yes. Which seems unusual as well. But then Cary well. Grant had seven and still rumours persist, you know, so I don't know. It's, it's very well, hard. Are we saying Elagabulus is the <laughs> Cary Grant uh, from, from Bristol? Um, yes. Uh, uh, yes Algernon Leach, right. as he was. Right. Um, Archibald. Archibald, yes, sorry, thank you. Um, uh, the, the Elagabulus is the Cary Grant of the 3rd century. Well, I, he certainly had a taste for drama. He liked to cavort around the room um, in support of Elagabulus, uh, the, the god. Uh, he liked to force uh, the Senate to watch him as he cavorted. So, so again, like Nero, there is mm. a strong connection, isn't there, or similarity between the allegations against Nero and Elagabulus? I think it's reasonable to say that if a boy is elevated to the most senior and uh, rarefied strata of society at the age of 14, just as he hits puberty, it might, you know, lead might him turn his head. It might. It, it seems... Well, that seems a very fair point, but doesn't necessarily make him a woman. No, I think that's also true. Well, Simon, thank you very much. That's all from me. Up next, it's Patrick Christie's. Patrick, what have you got on your bill of fare tonight? Well, record net migration figures predicted as Sunak let the side down there. Phil the Power Taylor, darting royalty. He joins us. He's backing Nigel Farage to win in the jungle and much, much more. We're also going to be talking about the Falklands. They are British and the new president of Argentina can get his grubby little mitts off them as far as I'm concerned. Lee Anderson on Benefits Britain. Nana Aquia on why the plague wasn't racist. And we do go live down under after 10. Oh, that's all going to be very exciting. I was um, talking about Nigel in the House of Commons yesterday and the debanking scandal, and I think uh, being debanked is probably even worse than being forced to eat cockroaches and to bathe in slime and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, that's coming up after the weather. I'll be back tomorrow at 8 o'clock. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg. This has been State of the Nation, and the weather in Somerset will be heavenly. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update with me, Annie, from the Met Office. It'll be staying cloudier through tomorrow with some rain moving in from the north, but still some sunshine on offer across southern areas with that high pressure still dominating, the ridge extending across many areas of England and Wales. But further north, we've got a weather front in charge throughout this evening, and that'll stay in charge into Wednesday and Thursday as well. So we've got rain arriving across much of western Scotland, parts of Northern Ireland as as well. Further south, it'll stay dry tonight, some mist and fog developing and temperatures falling lower than last night, as low as two or three perhaps in some southern counties. So a bit of a colder, mistier start on Wednesday morning, but the sunshine will come out throughout the afternoon once again, so not a bad day for the time of year. Rather different story though, farther no further north, with some rain persisting, particularly across the far north of Scotland, the northwest in particular, where the rain totals will start to build up. But despite the rain, it will be fairly mild for the time of year, as high as 14 degrees in northeastern Scotland. Then Thursday, there's little change for many areas apart from the far north where that front does then clear through and we've got much colder air behind it so we could see some snow showers starting to fall over the hills and generally there just will be a cold feel to the wind. That cold feel will become more widespread into Friday and will last into the weekend with temperatures falling to single figures.